as we start to think through what this country needs, I want people to, to back away from, okay, okay, well, this is the way it's always been done to, we know that the initial thesis was flawed in that it was using flawed theory, i.e. structural racism and everything that goes along with that. Let's reframe everything, understanding that if we didn't have this, how would we have done it? And really start to pour dollars into addressing those issues as part of a holistic solution with everything. There can't just be the healthcare silo and the education silo. Everyone has to work together in order to pr produce uh, good results. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring the innovators, creators, and disruptors who are changing the way that business happens. My name is Tyler Kelly, and I'm here with my co-host, Leanne Buchanan. Hey, everybody. Hello, hello. And we're very excited because today we are joined by Mr. Marvin Wilmoth. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. So Marvin, I'm really excited to have you here because not only are you an innovative kind of designer of communities that have legacy through your firm uh, Generation Development Group, but you're also the current vice mayor of North Bay Village. So politics, community design, a lot of things to unpack today. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's been an interesting experience for sure. Awesome. So we're going to talk about your roles in a moment. You okay. want to start with who? are you okay so marvin talk to us for a moment about what ignites you what are you passionate about fantastic um well uh, i know we were just talking about this a second ago but my family immigrated here from honduras um both my mother and father my dad from rotan my mom from la ceiba and so uh, what i can tell you about them is uh, my dad uh, enlisted in the army fought in vietnam and then re-enlisted in the navy so that lets you know a little bit about him uh, and then my mother was, uh, has been a teacher or was a teacher for 35 years in the school system. And so service was really ingrained in everything that we did. Um, and that really is the, the driver behind uh, everything I do. It's, you know, how can you make uh, life uh, better for someone else and for the people around you? So what is a pastime that we can find you doing that you perhaps spend way too much time doing? I... Music is my love language, okay. and so uh, I have a, a pretty big vinyl collection, and I like to listen to vinyl records quite a bit. Uh, I'm a pretty avid, car, uh, avid CrossFitter at this point in time, so uh, usually every day at around somewhere between 10 and 12 is my break from the morning when I was strategizing to the afternoon when I'm starting to get things done, so you'll, you'll catch me at the CrossFit gym working out, but uh, really music is, is the thing. So I. A little known fun fact, I actually learned how to DJ okay. um, only to mix the music for my wedding. Uh, so I'll have to let you hear that one day. Uh, did, did you DJ your reception? I, did, I DJed, I mixed music for both the reception, the um, the dinner afterwards, and the party. So okay. That explains your 40th birthday cake. It does explain <laughs> the birthday cake, yes. Because yes. I didn't get it, please, and now please I tell, do. Please tell. Tell, tell us about I the birthday this cake. <laughs> curated. I'm going to call it curated because it wasn't yeah. just a cake. It was an experience. Uh, but the cake itself was a was a vinyl uh, technique turntable okay. with a record on it, and the record happened to be um, I don't know if anyone knows reggae music, but Chronix's album that just okay. recently came out. It's one of my one of my favorites. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to um, you know for those that don't know you, have you walk us through the why behind what you do in your professional life. So kind of where did the origins around investing in communities through the built environment and really cultivating kind of an ecosystem around sustainability for underserved communities? Sure. You know, it really all started with, um, you know, when we founded Generation Development Group, and I know that we've talked about this, you know, our thought was, how do we really improve people's lives instead of just building place? I think. Um, developers oftentimes um, sort of focus specifically on profit and the bottom line and that all of those things are important. Uh, but the reality of the situation is if we're going to solve some of the social issues that we have right now, uh, a majority of them take place outside of just place. Uh, if we look at social determinants of health and what determines people's quality of life and longevity, 
place is only 10% of that. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is driven by uh, social behavior. It's uh, driven by individual decisions. And so, you know, we took a step back and said, okay, um, if we really want to improve life, we have to find a way to one, address changing people's behaviors and two, being able to quantify that in such a way that we can continue to tweak and make, uh, make changes for individual communities. Because what one community needs, another community may need something slightly different, but the basic building, building blocks are, are all there. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then there's the political angle of your duties. Now, just because I'm not familiar, is it appointed or elected? It's elected. Yeah. Okay. It's elected. So um, I was elected as commissioner and then uh, I was appointed by the commission as vice okay. mayor. Wonderful. So to, to walk me through, so entrepreneur on one hand, sure. and then like just like knocking on doors and saying vote, right? Yeah. Look, I, I consider it all to be uh, community engagement. Okay. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think uh, elected official life, especially at the hyper local level, is all about problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, you have limited resources uh, with which to solve, you know, very large problems. Uh, and that kind of has, has been one of the guiding and shaping forces behind generation development. Uh, what Leanne has not told you is that in addition to being uh, apparently a, a nationally syndicated co-host, uh, <laughs> she's also uniquely brilliant at um, sort of creating the scaffolding for community engagement and community mm -hmm. structures. And so over the last, I guess, 18 or 24 months, um, she would challenge me on a, on a sort of weekly basis to say, okay, well, you're trying to do that. Well, how do we know that that actually is happening? Mm. And so I've taken some of the experience that I've had engaging residents, um, both from a voting perspective, uh, as well as some of the, um, you know, all this is about using momentum and then taking that momentum and turning it into policy. So one example is uh, right before here, we're actually launching a, a thing called Plastic Free NBV. Mm -hmm. um, North Bay Village is a, uh, a city in the middle of the Biscayne Bay. And a lot of times, a lot of the plastic waste that comes from surrounding community, communities ends up on our shores. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have to be able to, to uh, convince not only our residents who obviously see this plastic on a daily basis, but also our surrounding neighborhoods that you know, your usage of single use plastics, whether it's plastic bottles, bags, ends up on our shore. So help us, help us preserve the environment, help us keep our, our, our community uh, healthy and safe. And so we've, we've used a lot of those engagement tactics in the same way, in uh, politics in the same way that we use them in development. So um, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit more, but one of the developments I'm working on right now is a place called Silo City. It was, uh, it used to be a, an old industrial silo complex that was used for um, grain processing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been abandoned for 20 plus years, but over that time, um, different artists, photography, musical artists, et cetera, painting, have used the space uh, because of that juxtaposition between old industrial and sort of some of the new green growth that's happened there as really a creative environment to, to do things. Uh, and one of our uh, one of our thoughts was, if we're going to do this development, we have to make sure that 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 soul, the heart and soul of that community, that creative element, stays. But not only stays, has a way for them to enhance their programming as part of it. Mm -hmm. And so we built out a ground floor ecosystem that helps to supplement some of the work that they're doing. So you know I'm going to go here. I know because, you're going to go there. Um, Wherever here is, I know you're going there. <laughs> um, you brought it up. You opened the door. Um, it's a generation model. So what a lot of what we talk about on Innovation City is helping people reframe what innovation is. A lot of times innovation is synonymous, synonymous with technology. I think innovation is much, much broader. And so I'd love for you to walk us through, use my favorite word, scaffolding, yes. but walk us through uh -huh. the framework or the pillars of the generation development model because it is truly innovative mm -hmm. when it comes to the way in which a kind of physical real estate developer looks at an engagement around a community from a revitalization perspective, from a community impact perspective, and I think most importantly from generation, from the idea that, you know, I think Native Americans say this, that the actions of today have a ripple effect seven generations forward. Absolutely. And that is, I think, the heart of the innovation of what you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you, you've, you've nailed it. Um, the reality of the situation is we were, we kept asking the question, why and how, till we got to the, the basis of the issue. And so 
uh, I'll walk you through our, our thought process. Again, we say we want to improve quality of life. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have to provide people access to opportunities, access to resources that they need. Well, why don't those currently exist? And we followed that rabbit hole until we got to um, sort of the basis of the housing industry. Um, and uh, if you think back to World War II, after World War II, the, the, the New Deal is passed. There's massive amounts of housing that are built. Um, you know, single family home ownership was greatly encouraged and supported through low interest rate loans and, and a number of other uh, means and methods. However, a lot of the ills, healthcare, um, healthcare, health disparities, educational disparities, income inequality, are really based around some of the fundamental um, systemic inequality issues that were part of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it did accomplish quite a bit, but the reality of the situation is it cut off a massive amount of the population, i.e. mostly African-Americans and, and people of color from, uh, from participation in, in, in that system. And so what that created was in uh, neighborhoods that were redlined, that were strategically and systematically disinvested in, uh, which then provided less access to fresh fruits and vegetables, which created uh, issues around uh, chronic illnesses and diseases, which we know cause massive amounts of uh, cost to not just our economy, mm -hmm. but to the quality of life of, of those people who live in those communities. And so we really had to go back to, to that systemic um, inequality and really start to address that in order to start building communities that were gonna be for the next seven generations, ones that could thrive. Uh, and so uh, understanding what, what we were trying to, to overcome, we really used those social determinants of health uh, and broke them out in, in pieces. So 50% of you know, your life expectancy can be determined based upon your zip code. Mm -hmm. And if only 10% of that is actually the physical place, the other 40% are, are you, do, are you a smoker? Um, do you exercise on a daily basis? Are you eating healthy and nutritious meals? Um, and so, as developers and, a, and as builders of ecosystem, we then now have to supplement those things because um, you're not going to get a grocery store to move into an area that's been disinvested in in the next, for the last 30 to 50 years. Um, they have specific metrics that they have to, uh, that they use in order to make determinations on where they're gonna put their grocery stores. And so we now have to bring in nutritious food and vegetables, understanding that we oftentimes will be the only people that will provide that. Mm -hmm. So an outgrowth of how do we improve quality of life was us creating a, uh, the Generation Grow initiative. And essentially, we uh, we work to provide use hydroponic container farms to grow fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. on site to provide that access very uh, locally, very close, mm -hmm. it's sustainably grown, it uses significantly less water than the same amount of acreage would, and you provide fresh produce at a price that is affordable for your residents, right? But again, we kept asking how and why. Okay, <laughs> now you have vegetables. I, uh, you know, I love to use my term. Uh, I'm Latino. We did not grow up eating Brussels sprouts. That was not on our on our dinner table. Oros y frijoles, y pechugo de pollo. That that's what we grew up eating. So if I want you uh, in your community to start eating more healthy vegetables that I'm growing on site, I then have to show you ways in which to prepare them. Mm. But I know that you're working eight hours a day. So if we're gonna do that, it needs to be prepared in under 30 minutes from start to finish. It needs to cost less than $30 and it needs to serve two to four people. Mm. And so we're really gonna work and partner with um, uh, celebrity chefs to create these kinds of meals using the food that we're growing on site, teaching those classes. And then now residents have not just access to the food, but a way in which to make it in a way that fits their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So that's when we, when we yeah. think through how do we really change quality of life and how do we really improve life, that's the, the, the bottom line issue that we're trying to get to. How does it look like when someone actually does it? And I think what's interesting is, you know, some people define innovation as creating something novel or new. And then there's the other, so disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the type of innovation is taking something from one discipline and then implementing it or applying it to another. So kind of like innovation by application. And I think what I love about the generation model is that it is really looking at the ecosystem of how do you activate different um, areas where you wouldn't apply it to a low to moderate income community, mm -hmm. 
but it serves the, the purpose. And so you're bringing in something new so that it's best fit and adapting it. One of the questions I have for you though, is with this more comprehensive holistic model mm. of community design and community cultivation, um, sometimes the economies of scale don't translate. Mm. So how are you thinking about um, to your investors, to partners, really packaging the economies of scale in terms of impact? Okay, that's that's a good question. Um, and you know, my uh, you talk about uh, combining experiences. I started my career uh, on Wall Street, and so uh, I started in investment banking. A lot of what I was doing was really turning the Rubik's cube from a financial perspective in order to get great valuation out of companies. Um, uh, my business partner and I both have that same sort of finance background, and we've thus applied that to uh, to real estate and community development. Now, what I think uh, what I think is often lost is once you figure out the best way, the most efficient way to use capital, I think people consider that to be what success is mm -hmm. in housing. We've built this housing um, for the cheapest price possible and we've made the most money. Uh, but the reality, and this is how I translate this to my, to my investors who are socially conscious, but also have return requirements and thresholds is, what really drives the valuation of a building or a community? It really is the desirability of that community to the people that live in it or want to live in it. Mm -hmm. And our thesis is that if we create a situation in a scenario in an ecosystem where people want to live in a given location because they know that if you move here, you're gonna have help with figuring out how to become a first time home buyer. If you move here, you're gonna have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. If you move here, your kids will have access to after school tutoring or uh, test prep or things of that nature. Now you have a community that's always always rented, fully rented, fully leased, uh, that's active and becomes a, a destination uh, and that is environmentally friendly and focused. And so that is gonna drive my valuation for my investors from a, from a social perspective. And the only reason why, or one of the main reasons why we were able to get to that get to that math is because we've come from a different industry outside of real estate and have really started to think mm -hmm. through, okay, how do we, what, what are the piece, what are the, the boxes that everyone needs to check that we can at that, at that point check everyone's box, but get to a place where everyone can participate in, in the upside. Yeah. What's your biggest challenge with getting to that point so far? Uh, education. Education uh, tends to be uh, the biggest thing. There are a lot of uh, preconceived notions around affordable and workforce housing. Um, I think uh, it's that conversation is now easier because uh, as we think through essential workers and that word essential has changed mm -hmm. over the last mm -hmm. six months, as we think about who's essential, uh, I think had you asked the question in January or December of last year, um, you know, we would have talked about firefighters and police officers and they are absolutely essential to, to everything we do. But I think we've now realized that our teachers and our people who are moving our trash, uh, the people who are serving our coffee, uh, the people who are delivering our food are is as essential as our medical professionals, mm -hmm. our doctors, our nurses. Uh, and so if that's the case, and this is who affordable workforce housing is supposed to be uh, addressing. We should be uh, we should be approaching it with the same care and intent that we do for all of our essential employees. That's excellent. I love it. You ready? I'm ready. Are, Are you, you ready? ready? Uh, I, uh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Lightning round. Lightning round. <laughs> okay, okay. So short answers, quick round of questions. Okay. So Marvin, what do you want to let go of? Ooh. I didn't say there were easy questions. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what do I want to let go of? Well, I'm sure you won't answer that in October the same way. I, I will not. I will not. Um, uh, I want to let go of a lot of the old frameworks of the way we do things. Mm. Um, housing being one of them, but I think there are a lot of different industries, instances, situations where because it's always been done that way, we continue to do it that way. And I want, as we start to, and I know this conversation is happening right now around reframing things through a social lens, as we start to think through um, what, this, what this country needs, I want people to, to back away from, okay, okay, well, this is the way it's always been done to, we know that the initial, the initial thesis was flawed in that it was using flawed theory, i.e., 
structural racism yeah. and everything that goes along with that. As we revisit solutions, let's reframe everything, understanding that if we didn't have this, how would we have done it? And really start to pour dollars and act and um, sort of time into addressing those issues as part of a holistic solution with everything. Um, I don't think that silos are any are any longer a way that we can address any issue. Like there can't just be the healthcare silo and the education mm -hmm. silo. Everyone has to work together in order to pr produce uh, good results. What makes you feel loved? Ooh, man, you guys have some good questions. <laughs> I mean, you know where you're coming. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. What makes you feel loved? Um, honestly, um, it's, I get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of uh, satisfaction out of doing things for other people. And then the love comes back in the appreciation for doing those things. Um, so I'm always a fan of, uh, of of hearing that feedback of thank you and you know things that you that, that you've done that are helpful for other people. What does this world need more of? Uh, more citizens and less individuals. Mm. I think that uh, had we had have, have we. Had we thought about the next person more than we thought about ourselves in February, as the way in which we're doing now, I think we'd be in a much better situation, holistically. How do you show love to others? Uh, doing for them, um, doing things for them, um, whatever it may be, but it's, it's typically a thoughtful thing. So uh, what Leanne needs is different than what you need, uh, is different than what uh, my brother or sister would need. So. Uh, doing very thoughtful and pointed uh, things for other people that, that they uh, can benefit from and that will help them out. Like a custom made old fashioned. Like custom made old fashions, exactly. <laughs> That'll sound good. The sweet nectar of the gods. <laughs> <laughs> so Marvin, um, who are your heroes? Uh, who are my heroes? It's funny, um, growing up my dad always told me not to have heroes because people are flawed and that mm -hmm. I should um, you can take good things from, from a lot of people, um, but you don't necessarily have to have heroes to do so. That said, uh, I, I would say my dad is definitely one of my heroes. Um, coming to a new country with nothing, um, fighting in um, a devastating war, uh, making it through that, and then subsequently uh, raising, um, raising a family that, you know, we started out with very little um, and put us in a situation and scenario that we could get a great education to uh, be in a position where we could solve problems that were outside of the immediate ones that are our own. And I recognize that privilege and I appreciate and, and love him for that. Can I ask one random question? Why not? Okay, so you love to travel. I do. Uh, we've had the pleasure of like meeting up on the other side of the world. Yes. What's your favorite place in the world? Ooh. I know it's hard to choose because you've been to so many. It, you know, it's funny. It's it's not. Um, I love Amsterdam. I love the Netherlands um, for a number of reasons. Um, one, I think that, and I love democracy, so don't hold it me. <laughs> I, I want to put that on the record. Yeah. Um, they have a very uh, moderate form of government, and so they govern by coalition, and as such, they're always sort of going down the middle of the road. They may veer slightly right or slightly left, but the reality of the situation is they're yeah. always moving in a in a situation in a in a direction that is good for the majority. Yeah, and I think that is what we would like to accomplish with democracy, um, but have sometimes fallen short with. Um, I like the fact that they. It, uh, sometimes for, mostly 40 to 50% of their housing is reserved for the people that live there, um, whomever they may be. And there's no stigma associated and attached with what they call social housing, which is essentially housing that Subsidizing. everyone can, can afford. Um, and then, you know, they just have great culture. They love art. They've been very open about uh, addressing issues, both racially and otherwise. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Amsterdam and, uh, and the Netherlands. Uh, they've been on the forefront of a lot of the sustainability issues that yep. we've been uh, trying to push as well. Well, Marvin, how, I mean, this has been great. Yeah. I, hold on, oh, I, oh, I would be remiss before okay. I before I move forward. Um, on my birthday, which was last Saturday, I was supposed to be uh, in Rwanda <laughs> yes. with a group of students. I, it was my 40th birthday. It's a milestone birthday for me, and I had every intention of spending that 
giving back to uh, high school students that um, we mentor through a group called the Nina Project that I think Leanne might be slightly familiar with. Um, but one of the things that brought a smile to my face was those students actually sent me a message on my birthday saying, you know, thank you for what you were, what you were doing and what you do. Um, and that was really heartfelt for me. So I want to thank you uh, because I think, you know, the, 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 the motto is um, travel awakens leaders. And a lot of what I've been able to, to put together in the generation model and a lot of what has improved my personal life and has opened my mind has been travel to, to mm -hmm. different places. And so we've I've been able to grab different pieces from different cultures and and hopefully can uh, bring it to a development model that uh, changes the world. Marvin, how can people get in touch with Generation and with you, social media, all of the above? Sure, we're on uh, Generation Development is on uh, all your social media. So we're uh, Generation DG on Instagram and Facebook. Um, uh, in my political hat, I'm Wilmoth Marvin on Instagram and Facebook, uh, and I can just generally be found. We have our, our our website is uh, www.generationdg.com. Uh, and um, my personal website is well, uh, marvinwilmoth.com. Awesome. Well, this thank has been you. fun. No, this has been great. I wish we had more time. I mean, I feel like we, we just have so many opportunities. We should do like a, it's not like a reality show, but like a reunion. A like reunion. Like Real Housewives have like a <laughs> reunion episode. I think we should have like a season reunion. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Marvin. No, thank Pleasure you both for, for doing this and bringing like to uh, entrepreneurs who are doing different things. This is really neat. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for listening to Innovation City. If you like this episode, you can find more episodes at innovationcity.co or anywhere where you watch or listen to podcasts. Please subscribe, rate, and review, and we'll see you next week. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we go.